my Facebook group? Right here. We are live. Okay. I had to click it one more time. Yeah, I just shared that in the Embodied Asian Man. So, oh, did you? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweet, man. Yeah, man. Dude, I'm excited. Um, I guess my, I'll do my regular intro here. Uh, this cool. is The Journey Within, so welcome, guys. Appreciate you uh, tuning in and, and, and being a part of this conversation. And uh, so this is The Journey Within. It's a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of a death and rebirth. And today I am very excited and nervous to be talking with, um, you know, someone that's honestly kind of rare in, in this space. Um, and I remember like just um, when you added me on Facebook and seeing your post, I actually saw you on um, some Asian group that you posted on. And I'm like, huh, this guy would be a cool guy to interview. Mm. So I'm just really excited to talk to uh, Samuel Shin. Mm -hmm. who has experience in psychotherapy and he just has this unique um you know perspective being that he is he's asian and has been a psychotherapist and so um samuel i'm very very honored to be uh, talking with you you today man oh i appreciate that i uh that's a very touching intro and yeah i i, I was wondering where we we found each other was it asian asian hustle network might have been that one. Yeah. Okay. I think you made a post and then I was like, oh, dude, this is interesting. Yeah. And you were talking yeah, about I, some really cool stuff. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about it. But yeah, I feel seen, which is rare in the Asian space, you know, to to have people uh, recognize like kind of who I am and the work that I've done. So yeah, I appreciate you having me on and, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Same, man. So um, is there anything maybe I missed? I know I did a brief intro, but maybe you just uh, describe who you are and, and what you do. Mm, okay. So uh, right now I'm a transformational coach. I work with Asian men. Um, I am also a certified men's work facilitator. I used to be a therapist and I practiced therapy for like six to seven years. And it was a holistic alternative type of training and education which i'm sure we'll talk about but it was uh like transpersonal psychology humanistic psychology um yeah so my training in therapy is also quite different than most therapists um but yeah i don't subscribe to any role it's it's hard to fit into a role because i've had such a diverse range of experience and um, you know, as much as I've done coaching and, and men's work or therapy, I've also been a meditator for a really long time and was really intensely involved with that and uh, like enlightenment seeker kind of person. And that was, I, I would say, as transformative as a lot of these other things. And sexuality, too, practices around sexuality have been as healing and powerful as therapy and other types of, you know, so I have a very interesting um background and training but i would say my approach is really about like who we are as human beings and mm. like fundamentally and how do we live in 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 a way that's uh we're fully expressing who we are as human beings which i think is um probably a lot of what we're going to talk about today yeah yeah so like um what what do you think inspired you to get to this place or like what what actually started you on this this curious journey to not only like the the therapy but the spirituality as well? Mm -hmm. Were you like always interested in that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I I it's one of the, I, I I kind of was. I mean, so I grew up Christian, uh, very Christian, fundamentalist kind of Christian Korean uh, nice. in Did Texas, you right? You're in Plano. Right. Yeah, yeah. Wait. So, oh, yeah. Are you from? You're I'm from the Dallas area, aren't you? Yeah. Bro. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's just that's a small world, man. Yeah. Of it course. So all the Koreans are in Carrollton. Right. Did you? I wanted to ask you. Did you speak in tongues? Um, my parents did. Uh, okay. from the adults did, but the the kids didn't. Gotcha. But my dad became a pastor, and like it was just Whoa. it was a big part of my upbringing. And uh, then I stood. So that was kind of spiritual, like. Like I kind of had to rediscover my relationship to Jesus as an adult and more recently, just in the past few years. But because um, that word was so that name was so loaded. But um, 
but yeah, when I was younger, I was very passionate about, you know, all that, uh, Jesus and, uh, worshiping. I loved, you know, so I, in some ways that might be like a, like something spiritual, but I would say it's predominantly religious. Like it was very strictly religious without too much of the spirituality. I would say my entry into spirituality really started with drugs actually. Um, Yo. as a teenager, yeah, I got really into drugs and, um, I was just a very introspective guy, a uh, young kid. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I used drugs as a way to deepen my understanding of myself and like experience myself. And, and it wasn't healthy, but it was, it definitely opened me up to a, a, a realm of consciousness that I'm not, I'm not even talking about like acid or psychedelics. It was just drugs in general. Um, they just kind of gave me a different experience of myself in life. And, uh, that was definitely, I guess, the catalyst or like the first entryway um, into, I would say, spirituality. And then, you know, I had a big shift around 1819 and got into psychology, really obsessed with psychology. Then a few years after that, I found meditation and just dove into meditation super deeply. I would say I, I, my, my aim in life were two things. Um, well, really one was like, how do I be myself? It's like, I want to be myself and how do I do that? And, you yeah. know, growing up Asian and, you know, very traditional family, I felt a lot of, um, there wasn't a guide, you know, there wasn't any, and it was, there was a lot of suppression. There was a lot of, it's the exact opposite of being yourself, you know, as you know, yeah. in an Asian yeah. family, it's like, it's, it's about the family. It's about communities, about other people. It's like, it's never about who you are and who you want to be. But I just, I, maybe because I grew up in the West, like my parents were from Korea, but I was born here. Like I just had this strong impulse, my brother too, but he kind of went a different route to express myself and be myself. And I fought tooth and nail for it. And that's what drew me to psychology was, was this interest in, in knowing who I was. Um, so yeah, that path took me down a lot of routes and then took me to that school, that very alternative school. And, yeah. um, and yeah, so that's, I think, and you know, that question of who am I and how do I be myself? That, that is, is such a deep question that that's yeah. what catalyzed all this shifts in my life and this transformation and this healing. So yeah. that's a great, yeah. that's a great question. And it's like, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. Like, um, so I, I grew up very similarly, right? Christian as well. Right. At some point I did speak in tongues later. Mm. Um, okay. so yeah. And, and I'm thinking like growing up Asian plus the uh, fundamentalism is like the worst combo for wanting to be yourself, mm -hmm. you know? So it's yeah. like both of us got this double whammy. Um, <laughs> was there a point where you really started to I guess, understand yourself, you actually started to express yourself more, I guess, readily, more authentically. Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. there a point where that that started for you? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So it was really when I went to grad school. So up until that point, I was kind of doing drugs off and on. I was really into neuroscience. I was very academic in undergrad. I was a neuroscience researcher. I was studying like the brain and how it, you know, uh, the underlying causes of uh, the neurological underpinnings of behavior, cognition, like, you know, addiction to all these things, but like from a neurological perspective. And I was very academic. I was very heady. I was very philosophical. And then I happened to go to this grad school uh, in San Francisco that um, had some like Buddhist and like Hindu uh influence and so that just inter interested me i wasn't into any of that at the time um but i wasn't a christian either at the time i was i was i had kind of uh, let that go and opened up more just to philosophy and stuff like that um but going to the school it's called ciis in Cal uh, the california institute of integral studies um and basically it's like uh that was the turning point because I through instead of being just in my head, that program forced me to experience 
change and experience healing and experience myself and maybe ways that I didn't even know myself. Like the first semester I was in a class. I like to tell this story, but I was in a class, group dynamics. We're learning how to do group therapy uh, by experiencing it ourselves. So the teacher is basically the group therapist. So the whole program, this whole school is based on experiential learning. It's not, there was one test in my three years of being at the school. Like, oh, it's all just experience and then writing about your experience is like the, the assignments. Um, so experiential learning, we're thrust into this environment where we're learning through the experience of, of, of the, the theories and the principles. So I, uh, we ta- they talked about the self. It's called T group. Have you heard of T group before? No. T group is basically the only, you're in a group and the only things you can talk about are uh, a, f- a feeling or a sensation. I think this is T group slash encounter group, but you're responding to each other by saying basically like nonviolent communication style. Like, Hey, like when you said that I felt this, like there was a warmth in my heart or, you know, I felt, I, 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 w- I felt ashamed because I, I was thinking you were judging me. So you're just literally talking from your personal experience feelings and 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 physical sensations you you're not even allowed to say what you're thinking like your oh. thoughts you just say i'm having a thought and then you just let it go but you you're not allowed to share the thought like you're just talking about literally <laughs> so i'm thrust into this environment without having any experience of any of this stuff never done any workshops or spiritual shit and and uh i had panic attack i was like in there oh my freaking God. out i didn't know it at the time but i was just like tense and then after the class, I like I saw that I popped a blood vessel because it was just like was so tense. And uh, but the the you know that's kind of how the whole program went was like talking about your own experience and focusing on that. And that's what I needed. I needed to like look inside and identify that I have a self that I have these thoughts, emotions, feelings, needs, independent of other people or parents, you know, that like, that's the Asian thing, right? It's like, there's no ba- fucking boundaries. You're just like, your parents are telling you who you are, but that's like their shit. And like, you're kind of forced to like, you know, like listen to them and like, you know, and like, and they shut your, de- shut your emotions. So it was like, that was the beginning of this unfolding and this unfurling of like who I was inside and these emotions and, uh, things like that, especially emotions. But, you know, the next semester I took a workshop on sexuality and doing these meditations with people where I'm like touch, touching their lower, like we're basically touching each other's genitals and shit. Like, like in this deep, deep, (laughs) what is this school? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very, very, very alternative. And, uh, and, and then I did. Yeah. Anyways. So there was a very focused on like experience and focusing on, on, the experience of, of your humanness. Right. And so that's uh that was a, a huge, that, that was just everything for me, you know, like mm-hmm. that, like being able to dive into these parts of myself and really explore them in a beautiful, beautiful way in a safe way too. And I mean, my experience wasn't everybody else's experience, but, um, but I really got a lot out of it. And it was, I would say I birthed a self through that, through that process which is uh if uh, yeah i don't know if we, you want to talk more about that yeah but that, yeah let's talk about that's that. something that i think a lot of asian people don't quite understand is is what is the self right the self yeah. as a unique independent or individualistic self an entity independent of other you know so so i would say that program helps me do that um in a big way interesting and so would you say that we develop, we birth this self through becoming aware of our um, desires and emotions? Uh, I would say the self is the reason it, how do I say this? The self needs to be supported, seen, uh, like basically it happens in families. The self, we all have a self, we all have a unique expression that we're born with. You can call it the soul. You can call it, you know, personality, temperament, whatever. We're all, we're all born with that, whether Asian or not, but in Asian families, the conditions are not such that parents 
or the child will 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 be able to have their self uh, structure, I guess, if you will, develop. You know, so it's like here's this child, this like amorphous, you know, just no bad, like no self thing that's born, but it has like this light to it. And then like as it develops emotions, as it develops thought, as it develops personality, the parents are kind of there to see this child reflect back and attune to this child and you know all like really see them for who they are i mean ideal the ideal is to see the child as they are right um doesn't mean you just like cater to their every every whim or desire that you, they need boundaries as well but but you know it's it's through that process of relationship and attunement and reflection that the child begins to understand himself and know himself and and develop a healthy ego is what you call it in psychology a healthy right self-regulating system uh that kind of understands himself or herself and has emotions and needs and, and all these things and that's just not you know that that's just something that's not there for asian uh, parents for the most part like i say like 90 something percent as yeah. far as what i've seen working with the asian community i've seen some families who or some people who i'm like wow they their parents were different than most asian parents but but that process not being there, it, it just doesn't allow for this thing to develop this, what I'm calling the self in a lot of Asian people. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's what I would say as far as like where that comes from. I forgot what your question was, but I forgot but, yeah. my question too. Yeah. But so I, I have, I have a curious question and um, sorry, I didn't prepare you for this. No, it's okay. Um, why do you think like what is it about asian culture and this is like maybe like a two-part question so mm -hmm. um in your opinion what is it about asian culture that doesn't do that and then maybe yeah. my follow-up question would be you know it, it seems to have worked all of these centuries right asians have been existing for a long time so it seems to have worked for a long time but now that we're in the west it seems like it doesn't work Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if I might my question there more like a comment. But... Yeah. I mean, the the quick answer is like, oh, you know, there's like the collectivistic and then the individualistic culture and the contrast between that. And I think there's some obviously some truth to that. But it, this is I think if you go deeper, it's like one. Um, I think it comes down to resources, to be honest. I, I think it comes down to resources, maybe education, but really resources. Because if if resources are limited, then the family needs to survive together and everybody needs to kind of play their part. If one person's like, I want to be myself and I want to go fucking over, you know, to that other tribe and like, I like them. Like, that's just not kosher. That's you, <laughs> the family's not going to yeah. survive, right? So in some ways, Asian cultures they're only newly kind of developing into second first world countries by and large they've been they've been uh third world countries um so i think you can also see this in other uh cultures as well that are not as developed as the, as western society like third world countries and and things like that um so i think that's a big part of it but there is also the like whole confucian thing the whole like parents are fucking god and you know the the children are sub, they're just meant like it's you know you're, you're supposed to teach them and they're supposed to be respectful and like there's 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 an inherent power dynamic like it's you know i mean i grew up i don't know what, where's your family from is it uh, Chinese, taiwan taiwanese yeah yeah like in korean culture like i grew up like my friends who were like one year older than me or even less, like I had to defer to them, you know, like they were my elders in a way, like they, I had to call them young and they would like, yeah. you know, fuck, they'd like hit me and shit if I didn't like right. respect them, you know? It was, oh it's shit. Like, and yeah. And, and people say, I've heard that Korean culture is, is one of the most Confucian Korean and Japanese. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, you get that a lot too, this, this real power dynamic and this, uh, parents are the authority and so in that type of environment you're you're you know you're going to get this uh treatment of children that is not conducive to this independent individual you know unique expression or unique human you know it's more just like kind of objects and cogs in a wheel you know hmm. that's that's okay. my theory at least you know like i i mean i 
everybody just talks about collectivism and individualism, but I'm like, I, I don't know. There's, I, I think there's something about uh, like the lack of resources and what that does. It's just survival. There's lack of education. Um, yeah, different things like that, I would say. Hmm. Again, I forgot your question. <laughs> it was like, what it was, it what was a, is causing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that that was really that's that's really interesting. I had not thought about all of those factors together. So okay, yeah. that's that's cool, man. Um going back to developing the self, the yeah. ego. So you're saying once we become once we're witnessed as a unique individual, we become aware of our emotions. Yep. Is there anything else other than than those things? I might have missed it. Um that would help us to develop a healthy sense of self. Oh yeah, I mean, there's so many. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is like the basis of all therapy. Is, is yeah, yeah. You know, how do you develop a, a yeah healthy emotions, emotional regulation, uh, healthy beliefs? You know, trauma, all that stuff. So, so I, I guess uh, if we're gonna stay on the self aspect, though, um, I do think that you, if you didn't get emotional uh, emotional attunement and reflection like uh certain conditions met like unconditional love unconditional acceptance these types of things in family you're always going to have some problems whether you're asian or not it's gonna you you're going to develop some some uh something's going to go not so optimally in your system you're not going to develop optimally because you're those conditions that allow for this growth and this development of the self or whatever you want to call it didn't go optimally either. Right. So like these, you're going to need to get those needs met in some way. And I think that's a lot of the value of therapy and whether it's coaching or healing relationships. Yes. There's all these techniques and stuff like that, but in the end, like the relationship is really like, you know, like you, you, you work with a coach who doesn't really see you and understand you or, you know, care about you. Like that's not going to, go anywhere you know like the work is gonna be it doesn't doesn't matter what techniques they have like it yeah. might maybe it's gonna go somewhere if the person like um it, it, i could see it, it happening but but yeah anyways it yeah I, I think those needs do need to get met at some point um which is the value of a lot of like healing relationships and and so those places in you or whomever like that this where the self is it, it's maybe stuck or not quite developed or you know there's some unresolved issues or trauma like that that i think needs to be 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 seen you know and be accepted and and uh, uh understood and supported in a way that's going to allow that to heal so um and then through that process the self kind of strengthens or you know they develop some better capacity to regulate themselves you know like there's a concept in therapy and therapy called internalized uh, transmuting internalization. This is an alternative. This is from self psychology, which isn't what a lot, a lot of, uh, um, you know, therapists will have, will have learned, but transmuting internalization is basically this function that parents usually provide for the child that eventually the child is then learns through this modeling and through this, like, basically the child internalizes that function. So like mm -hmm. parents, know how to regulate their own emotions that just becomes imparted onto a child right or if the parents you know have positive self-talk or if they you know um are are, are loving and con you know compact like those things will become imparted onto the child uh through this process of internalization and uh i just i you know you maybe you you have experiences like that i've definitely had experiences with therapists where after working with them i still think about them uh, or I thought about them for a while, maybe a couple of years after, but then I just, that, that whatever they provided for me became ingrained. Like the, the way mm -hmm. that my therapist, her compassion towards me during times when I didn't know how to have compassion for myself, like that, I, 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 I saw it, I felt it, and then I remembered it. And then like, now I don't think about her at all. Like it's just become a part of who I am, you know? Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of I think I'm just talking about relational healing, but but um, the mechanism behind it and how that impacts the self. Right. How that allows for this these parts of us to to heal and to to develop and strengthen and all that. So, yeah. 
where does that play into uh, developing as a man and being quote unquote masculine? <laughs> you know, because um, when I think of masculine, and maybe this is just my conception, right? I think of like David Goggins. For sure. You know, that kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. like no and tough <laughs> love. Like, right. I mean, yeah. or maybe even Tony Robbins or something, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's, right. Okay. Um, so what's your question? It's it's where does all that play yeah, into like, masculinity? Yeah, yeah, like being masculine. Question. Um, I think uh, that, that's a really good question because I think up until this point, we've been talking about maybe more of a feminine, um, like I'm talking about compassion, unconditional love, like these emotional attunement. A lot of that um, comes from mothers, right? A lot of that's provided yeah. for early on in life where uh, in childhood and the mother is really important and provides that nurturing environment. Yeah, I think father, fatherhood and masculinity is something that's sort of similar. Like I think the attunement still needs to be there, the unconditional love, but, uh, but it's definitely more like tough love, right? Like you, you said tough love, right? Yeah, so yeah. I think both are essential. Like I literally think there's two types of love, right? Like the, the nurturing kind and then like the, the type that's like get up off your ass and like do the shit you need to do and like, you know, yeah, but man up or whatever. Like literally that masculine energy and it doesn't have to be just for men, but but that is provided for by the father in a way. Or I think uh, it can be a social environment. Um but I, I think the father is also an important piece to all this because if the, if the father isn't providing this or the father isn't present or, uh, you know, loving and supportive in this way, um, then the, ch the, the kid's probably going to have some problems. Like when I hear stories of people who learn masculinity from like other people often and they didn't have a good model for it, right? Like in a good adult model, um, it's usually kind of disconnected. It's not like like in it's not coming from a place of integrity it's not they, they didn't develop there's like a missing experience because the the dad is as much as the mom is important the dad's also yeah. important for development i would say but yeah there's not a lot of talk about fatherhood in in uh in psychology it's all about the mom <laughs> yeah that is now that you mention it that's kind of true that's um i haven't heard a lot about the dad yeah dad's like later dad's like probably five and on but zero to five is typically mom is like really you know less and less the case but she's the more important figure hmm. which makes sense so i had a question i kind of forgot it but what were you talking about you were talking about masculinity the, okay that's right yeah so when when you say masculine, feminine, masculinity, femininity, um, maybe oh, you can expound on that. Like, question. what do you? I hate huh? this question. <laughs> I hate this question. It's, yeah, it's it's very confusing because the terms themselves are no matter how much we want to say, oh, you can be a man and have feminine, or you could be a woman and have mat. Like, it's true, but those words are so associated and they're they're really tied in with with gender. So. Yeah. I don't like having the conversation, but I, but the, yeah, they're just, you know, there's different qualities, you know, like this, this, this is on all levels, like physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like masculine and feminine are, are, are yin and yang. It's they're they're two types, two parts of a, a polarity, you know? So, um, and I do think there's a correlation for sure. I don't know if this is where you're going, but I'm just, I need to share my thoughts on this. Like there is a correlation between masculine energy and, and gender. You know, I, I mean, there, there obviously is, um, but you know, maybe that's going to change in the future. Who knows? But um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, even to sit, tell you like what I think masculine energy, what's masculinity or what's femininity. I'm, I'm, I don't even know if I want to talk about it, to be honest. I could just feel myself like I, that conversation, yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. so if, if, if you're interested in that conversation, you could Google it. And there's like so many answers, you know, like literally like qualities of the masculine qualities of the feminine. And I, I wouldn't disagree with those, to be honest. Got you. Um, going back to 
having a father, a strong father with, with some tough love, but still emotional attuned. Mm. Um, so let's say we never got that, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like a therapist, generally speaking, is much more quote unquote feminine, right? More sure. compassion, witnessing, all that stuff. Um, so how do we actually, do we need this, this male figure to then kind of like reparent us in a mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have one, like, what do we do to really develop mm -hmm. that masculine side? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I, I could just speak from my own experience and, you know, I guess my theories around this, but yeah, I do think, uh, I do think it's important to have a actual human being that's there modeling, providing this love and support. Like if we don't get those needs met for a father or a mother, our psyche is just going to, it's, it's not going to feel whole and complete. Like you can do that healing later on. Like if you didn't have those early experiences, but I do think that they need to happen in, in some form of relationship. Um, like we're human beings and we're social creatures. We're relational creatures. That's how we learn. Like there's so much that happens in our brains and our nervous systems and our, you know, and who we are through human contact. Like, I can like one of my first real exposures because my my father was not he was not very masculine. Let's just say that very I wouldn't say feminine per se, but it was just like his masculine energy was not there and uh, maybe trauma or, you know, I don't know. But he, he, he was pretty much a young, hurt little boy. And um, so my first model one of my first models for masculinity was actually Tony Robbins. Um, oh. And it was through, you know, I felt a little bit of the energy and the frequency of whatever my authentic masculinity might, might look like in him. And it was through the screen, right? Like I didn't go to any workshops, but, and that was powerful. There was a sense in which that allowed me to develop my masculine energy, but I did also work with uh, male therapists you know, okay. around that time, maybe even right at that time, I had a, I actually had one before that too. Um, but yeah, there's just something about that missing experience of having a father figure not be there, um, at least in a, in a healthy way or, you know, or maybe at all. But um, there was something about having a male figure that healed that for me, you know, that, that healed this wound. And then later I'd, got into men's work and I was, you know, in these huge retreats with like a hundred to 200 men, you know, doing like really intense, intensely masculine things, but also, you know, what might be more the feminine, doing shadow work, diving into emotions and, and, and connecting and relating to each other, a lot of physical touch and like hugging and saying, I love you. But, but there was also like wrestling and like, just like, rah, like just screaming, like, ah, like in the fucking middle of the desert, like, you know, that, that was also something I needed. It was definitely a missing experience for me. And, and I think it was through those experiences that, yeah, I, there, there was some part of me and my identity that I didn't quite, uh, wasn't able to develop in my, in, in my upbringing, um, that I was able to develop through those types of works and through those relationships. So I do, Yes, to answer your question, I think there is there does need to be a, a an actual, like actual human beings because we are human yeah. beings, right? Yeah. No, makes sense. So uh, actually, this would be a great transition into, um, you know, what do you do in these uh, in these men's workshop? Like, what does men's work uh, really entail? <sighs> I think everybody's going to have a different definition. Um, I mean, I have a very uh, simple definition, which is just men supporting other men, right? So in any environment where you're getting men supporting other men, that's basically not sports. That's not, not like being in business or sales or, you know, like I know there's like a bro culture there. It's like something that's more focused on like personal development and helping you be the best version of yourself. So any group of men that are coming together and doing that, or that's men's work because that's what, what I've seen being in this space. A lot of people, a lot of different organizations, they're, they're all doing it a little differently, but the essence is the same. It's just when you get a group of men together and the intention is to be real, to be honest, authentic, vulnerable, uh, to not just like 
to, to own your shit too and to not just like project onto other men because that's what happens in society like some some man is sharing something vulnerable the other men feel judged like it, they're uncomfortable in themselves with that emotion or that experience you know and so then they shut them down or they give them advice or that's that's typically what happens um in my opinion like it, it's projection based but when you're in an environment of uh with men who are owning their shit they're owning their their side and they're not going to jump onto your side like and they're just listening right and they're just attuning emotionally right they're just being present that's in that type of environment a lot a lot happens like you're, you're breaking paradigms of thousands and thousands of years of men not being able to open up in that way or be real in that way and talking about fatherhood right like this is a, a wound that so many men have uh, fathers who had their own traumas and you know maybe they uh, left and they couldn't stick around or they just weren't present emotionally or you know like we also need this intimacy in connection with our our dads and so for thousands and thousands of years this wound is, is also there so with the group that i i got trained with they really uh incorporate a lot of physical contact like touch like intimate touch i mean you're not like necessarily holding each other but actually they do that in the shadow work like they literally a guy is fucking breaking down bawling no words even you're not processing it like therapy it's just pure emotion at this with this group and uh then there's like 10 15 other men gathered around him there's like one or two facilitators who are like kind of leading the way but every everybody puts a hand on the man when he's just like fucking shaking and like you know like convulsing or just like screaming fuck yeah and it's and 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 he's being held like literally held um physically by these other men um but there's also just like you know putting your hand on another man's heart and just like like just connecting in different types of ways and i think this is you know if we're going to talk about talk about masculinity and uh you know where the wound or the you know i don't like using toxic masculinity but like the problems that a lot of men face come from these types of things and these types of environments not being around and fathers not really being around or being able to support men in in the ways that men or boys need um so that's a lot of what men's work is trying to do is to try to fill that that gap and to to um yeah to provide a space where men can heal heal these wounds Mm. yeah so i'm assuming that um you know you're taking things from well the the very experiential uh, school meditation breathing all these different things um i'm curious on your opinion on like the the therapeutic space right now just more more in in general not not your um more alternative one but just in general in the west like yeah, yeah. what do you think what do you think we're doing right? And then what do you think uh, maybe needs some some work, some supplementation? Oh, man. I mean, I could talk about this for an hour. Um, yeah. Oh, this isn't a this is not a popular opinion. Like I, I, I left the mental health field, right? I became a coach, became a life coach, uh, teacher, whatever. And, and, and I left mental health for the reason that I'm going to talk about, um, which is I, I think mental health is one, a total misnomer it has nothing to do with, well, it doesn't have nothing to do, but it's not about our mind just our mind it's not about mental health it's not about mental illness that's just western society's obsession or 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 fixation on the mind and thinking and rationality and logic you know which comes from you know descartes and all that stuff so like everything in the west is going to be focused on the mind yeah. right so they notice these people who are you know exhibiting certain symptoms or or not acting normal and they just say oh something's wrong with their minds and you see this in like asian cultures too it's like oh like they, they don't have a word for like they just call you there there's something wrong with their mind i don't think it's a mind thing you know the psyche is such a multi-dimensional thing it's emotions and and you know there, there's so much more going on than just the mind with mental illness so i have a problem with just that term 
Um, but I think, um, I think my biggest gripe with it is actually that it's part of the Western medical system. And, you know, this is where I'm also pretty alternative. I'm very holistically oriented. Um, I don't think, I don't like Western medicine. I think it's good. Interesting. I think it's good oh. for, you know, very critical conditions and saving people's lives and, you know, like breaking, you know, fixing it. On, like, there's a lot of things it's useful for, but as far as healing goes and as far as human, you know, being a human, which is a lot of what mental illness or uh, these things that develop, like we're talking about earlier, these, these developmental things that don't go right. You know, that's a human problem. It's not a medical problem. And so right now there's so much emphasis on the brain, neuroscience, medications, pharmacology, all these things, which are not effective. They have, they really have no place with, with mental illness. Um, but again, that's a Western thing. It's a Western medical thing. Um, the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, his name's Tom Insel. He, he, he had a quote, he left and then I think he's working in like tech or something. He's working for like Google, but he had a, he had a, uh, um, quote where he's, um, you know, he, he just, he basically, he just said he, they put all this money his 13 years of working for the NI, um, you know, national Institute, Institute of mental health, put all this money to research genetics, neuroscience, uh, research, research, research. What was the outcome? Nothing. Like they did, they weren't any better at solving mental illness. Mental illness actually, you know, got worse. And it's like, huh. so, so he, he's basically saying that, and that, you know, they, they don't know how to deal with mental illness. Like the mental health system is broken in this country. And I think that's a hundred percent true. Uh, I think there's a lot of good that comes from it because it's allowing people to have a space to talk about some of the trauma and some of the difficulties and learn about themselves. But by and large, I think the Western mental, mental health system is, is missing the mark. I think 80 some 80% 80 of therapists are not really good therapists. Whoa, that yeah. is a high number. It's a really high number. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I actually heard that from one of my professors, but, but I agree. Like I'm very selective about who my therapists are. And oddly enough, the school that I went to, uh, which, you know, there were no tests, right? Um, mm -hmm. It was just this experiential learning and, you know, human humanistic stuff and like stuff that's kind of woo woo even like sometimes we meditate before our classes. Um, we had the highest rate of students or graduates pass the licensing exam, pa pass the California licensing exam on the first try. So the first try, Graduates are taking, you know, they get out of grad school, they take the exam. CIS had the number one rate of students who, who, who pass out of all of California. I don't know if that's still the case, but, um, you know, a lot of that exam is like intuition. It's like this client has these problems and this and this, and what would you do? So it's hmm. like the learn the school that I went to just through the experience of going through what clients go through or healing or going through our own healing process, we develop a really, really deep and solid understanding of, you know, how to understand people and how to help people. It's intuitive. And, um, and that's a rare school. You know, there's only like a few schools like that in the country and it's an unfortunate thing, but, but that's, uh, you know, obviously I have a bias, like I'm very far, like very alternative in a way, but I, this yeah. is, this is my opinion. It's, it's not something that you're going to hear, you know, from a lot of people and this isn't even to say that mental health and therapy isn't useful um, because the, the thing that's really good at is understanding trauma, you know, understanding trauma and connecting that to present behavior, present relationships, problems and all that. Um, yeah. It's really, really that's that's the fundamental basis of all, all therapy. Yeah. So and and maybe I'm wrong on this, but. I found out that a lot of uh, therapists are not trauma informed, which boggles my mind. <laughs> and it's like, so, so I was listening to, um, um, uh, MP3 on like healing shame. It was by, um, these two psychologists, um, the center of healing shame. And it was, it was a great, it was a great, uh, 
track to understand mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And and in the introduction, you know, they're saying like, yeah, a lot of therapists don't even know this stuff. And I'm thinking, what the shit? What are you talking about? This is such a basic, like mm-hmm. things about no- knowing about healing shame. Like yeah. maybe like every therapist should know about this. I'm, I was just like, wait, yeah. let me listen to that again. Wait, a lot of therapists don't even know this. How is that possible? So anyways. That's yeah, I'm again, I think it's a huge huge uh reason for that is the 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 fact that it's it's so uh just in embedded in the western medical system like like it, it it's a medical issue it's not a human issue this is a problem with your brain this is a problem with genetics like uh the the like cbt right the the cbt is like the big thing these days and and you know, again, it's because it has the word cognitive in it. Like you're literally working with more concrete things that you can see or that are tangible, like right, thought you can measure. behavior. Yeah. yeah, that you can measure. It's it's and so, and there's some places where that's effective, but by and large, like for example, with trauma or pretty much any other mental illness issue, I think um, they're not learning about trauma. They're just it's literally just your thoughts and your behaviors. They're not looking at deeper things that you cannot measure, which, you know, things from childhood, like you can't measure emotions, you know, you can't, you can't measure like somebody's like relationship with their mother or father, not going, you know, like the things that we talked about earlier with these missing experiences. If you're just focusing on symptoms, if you're just focusing on these things that you can measure, you're not going to look at the link between these very huge, like if you if you if if you're a fucking human, you know you just know. Oh, okay, if somebody like was hit as a kid or their parents abandoned, like they're gonna have problems. Like, why is that so, you know, bizarre to us? And then as they're a, an adult, and then now they're like having these really big problems. Then it's like we gotta give them meds, or we gotta like figure out like you know like what's going on their behavior. Like, it, it, fuck, like it's fucking trauma. And, uh, and these early experiences. So it's, for me, it's, again, it's just a very human experience. You know, it's something that comes down to, to who we are as human beings and, you know, family environments and these conditions that we all need as children to grow up and to be healthy, functioning adults. And it's, um, for me, it's very intuitive, you know, like it's just, it, it, that, that's why I don't even feel like I'm a therapist anymore because it's just, this is just, human beings like if we were all taught this stuff like if this was a part of our education as it should be like yeah. it wouldn't be so you know outlandish to talk about this stuff but like i'm on this podcast with you talking about this as if it's like you know and and a lot of people you know i don't know who's watching but like this is not just what i'm saying but a lot of people are eating the shit up like social media like there's so much positive psychology and like stuff about healing and people just they, they're, they're eating it up because it's it's resonating. It's touching something in them. And we're just not educated around it. Yeah. Um, and we're actually educated, like, in in to think the opposite, right? To think, like, the brain, the genetics, the... Okay, the, yeah. You know, so, so that's why we don't really understand it either. Hmm. Um, could you share about being embodied? And I... Mm. Yeah, and like I know you're talking about in the West, it's all about the mind, very uh, Descartes, very Newtonian, cognitive behavioral mm-hmm. therapy. So, yeah, could you talk about like being embodied and 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 what does that mean? How do we do that? Yeah, and I think the reason why, why you're asking this question is because you know I have a Facebook group called Embodied <laughs> Asian Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People don't know uh, which you're part of, and some other men are a part of. But but uh, yeah, I that I love. I'm 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 glad you asked because. I have a very um, uh, specific kind of theory about this, which is um, I'm going to drink some water before I get into it. I think you'll understand it. Mm. But I don't think I've ever shared this, but um, there's three processes and embodiment is the, the last part. So the first is insight and realizations, like insight realizations is kind of the same. And then you have integration, process of integration, and then you have embodiment. Okay, so so you have an insight, you have a realization, whether it's therapy, ayahuasca, like meditation, whatever, right? Hypnosis. Like you have this, ins- like it's this ex- this experience of a different ex- something different, and like 
something more expansive perhaps that then that doesn't change your you know it takes a while for your brain and your nervous system and your body like things to change emotionally right like it's not like like that insight is going to do everything that insight right. is actually going to integrate and so what that means is I mean, you could talk about it in terms of like frequencies and stuff like that, but, but I think you're following me. So, so that, that then you have an integration process and that integration process is like this new experience colliding with the old, the old identities, the old emotions, the old patterns. And that's a difficult process. A lot of people don't recognize that they, you know, go on, go on an ayahuasca trip and then they come back and it's like their life starts to fucking fall apart. Like this is supposed huh. to happen, you know? relationships changing what well, doesn't even have to be all ayahuasca it's just healing right so there's this kind of process of the two kind of coming together and this shift and this transformation happening that's that's an integration right like the, the change the like transmuting process and then the embodiment and that happens through experience right the relationships changing the the leaving a job or like uh, something tangible actually happening something concrete and then through that, through those actions and changes, that's where the embodiment happens, right? So that new insight or realization, and I mean, I'm making it so it's like, you know, step by step, but it's, you know, it, 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 it is kind of like this, but yeah, because you can have more insights and realizations around the same thing. And But uh, yeah, the embodiment is the end result of all that, right? So now you, you've embodied that insight and realization in this new way of being such that it's who you are. You know, it's just like your life is reflecting that your relationships, your, your, what you're spending your time on, your thoughts, your emotions, like you've now become a different person. So, so that's my definition of embodiment, I guess, is, is like you are uh, embodying it. It's your nervous system. It's like your, your, your thinking, everything is now, your identity is now that person. Yeah, that's, that's interesting that you were talking about in the integration process, um, things actually sometimes get worse. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like For that's sure. what happened with me. Like the past three, however many years I've been doing yeah. this when I started. Yeah. I felt like it actually, things got worse. Like I got, I felt more anxiety and more shame and more anger and more grief, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, like and in, in emotions intensified like crazy, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. good. Yeah, I think that's supposed. Yeah, that's supposed to happen, and that's what people don't talk about, you know, because it's not sexy to talk about that, you know. Like, let's talk about the high vibe, like the joy, the gratitude, but like, the the reality is that those things that you've been suppressing or that you've been denying or that you've been judging or you know, like all that needs to come up, and then there's the shadow element, which is the judgment and the shame and the like pain and the ugh, the trauma, like all that's coming up. But underneath that is this authentic, like, you know, like these emotions you're talking about, those are healthy, but they were probably, um, you know, uh, they were like, what's a good word? What am I trying to say? They were like hidden or there, there's a layer of, of something above that. Right. Right. And so when you are healing, it's like, and when you want to be your authentic self, when you want to be a, a whole human being and, you know, whatever, like you're, that includes all these parts of you that you've been shutting down or sequestering or pushing away. And then and that also is going to include the shame and these layers of, you know, trauma and like these things that have been blocking that. And so, yeah, integration is, is, is fucking messy, you know, healing or whatever you want to call it, that process of like first you begin the journey and then the journey is like, oh, like it's mucky, you know, it's uh and and but you know again it's like you're embodying throughout the way you're having insights realization throughout the way you're integrating different things throughout the way it's not just like this we're talking about it as if it's just like one process which it might be in some way but um you know it, it, it's it's multi-faceted and uh you're doing multiple different parts of yourself and integrating multiple parts of yourself at different times and yeah yeah so so yeah the shadows are in the sense good you know they really are i think i think that's a lot of the the healing comes from from that would you agree would you say that that makes sense given what you said yeah for sure mm -hmm. um yeah i'm still trying to you know get in touch with my shadow and integrate that sure there's a lot of things in my body that i'm i'm trying to integrate so i'm like let's like speed it up man <laughs> like, yeah you know for uh, sure yeah it was the same way 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, damn, I had a question, but totally, totally forgot. Oh, but um, yeah, um, just just switching gears here um, to the topic of spirituality. Yeah. And where where does spirituality come in in all of this healing and men's work and all this different stuff? Um, I'm just pausing for a second and like feeling my body. <laughs> uh, I could feel all the ideas and this passion coming out of me, but I'm like, oh, Ooh, just breathing. Um, okay. So spirituality. Hmm. Um, oh, I, I, immediately I want to cry. And I think it's because spirituality is just like, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing for me. You know, like I've gone through a lot of experiences of, um, finding trust, I guess you could say, right. It's like finding, trusting the universe falling. And it's like there, even when it's dark as hell. And it's gotten to a point where I think, you know, given the, within the context of what we're talking about, there's so many different levels to it, but one, the biggest level might be that there's something holding us. There's always something holding and carrying us. That's bigger than us. That's in everything that's around us. That's, you know, it, it's always here, you know, it's even us. And, and the fact that it's there is it just, it, it I don't know. I feel, um, uh yeah there's not really a word for it but like you know it's the tears it's like i'm touched touched by by how spirituality is is actually inseparable from everything you know it's like it's just a part of 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 who we are part of life part of the universe it's, there's not really a way to put it into words but yeah like so um so i guess it, it just feels like a trusting thing right it feels like something is always carrying me and uh, carrying other people. And I think I know that. I think I know that in some ways I've embodied it, not 100%, obviously, but but it, it informs my work with people, right? It's like, no matter what yeah. somebody is going through, I'm, I'm able to somehow allow the growth to always be, and and the the healing or the, 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 the evolution, like, I, I really do think that consciousness is always evolving. Consciousness is like that we as human beings with each successive generation, like we're becoming more evolved and you can do that. And I'm doing that in a way with my clients uh, when I'm being present with them. I'm allowing that evolution and that change to happen quicker. And I think that's a spiritual process. I think there's something insanely spiritual about transformation and what we call healing uh in a way that i i couldn't really summarize i think um but that going back to the trust thing it's like that it's 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 something um uh maybe benevolent right it's something that it always always has our best interest in mind and maybe to go back to the top the, to the topic of tough tough love and and like kind of nurturing love the universe is the same way right like it's like sometimes healing is very nurturing like you know and and, and pleasant and you know oh, like relieving and then sometimes it's just like these intense shadow shit that you're talking about right and yeah. and like literally experiencing through life but that is also always in service of your growth always in service of you embodying more of your soul and who you are and i i'm lucky that i i feel like you know i mean i guess i don't know if it's just luck because i've had to learn it the hard way but it's through lots of trials and really intense things and probably something from like my ancestors or you know just that I've been able to hold that perspective through my own process and through the process, through the process I hold for, for other people. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, I think, um, to, to, to know and to, to feel. So I know it's, uh, it's hard. To, it, yeah. It's, it's, there's nothing tangible there, but it's, it's fair. It's just, that's, that's my perspective on that. I yeah. guess we can get, we can get a little more tangible if you want. 
Yeah, I, w- I wanted to ask you because um, it seems to me, and of course, there's so many different traditions in spirituality, right? But it seems to me in the, in the circles that I'm I'm more familiar with, um, they talk about like dissolving the ego, that we're okay. all one, right? And we're, you know, it's all love. And, and I believe all that, but it seems to me that that's almost the opposite of what um, a lot of traditional therapy and what you're talking about, about being a self, about being an a, a individual, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like, how do we reconcile those mm-hmm. ideas? Okay. So there's, I think the, the reconciliation happens um, in humanness, right? So it's, so actually there's, there's, let me, let me pause for a second. Cause I know where I want to go with this. Um, if you want to be enlightened, if you want to be in wa- awakened, if you want to be your full potential, if you want to be your true self, whatever the, whatever it is, um, it is going to require your, so the ego is a structure. The ego is actually a, uh, an identity. It's a structure. It can, you can change identities, but it's 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 our connection to this human experience, society, relationships. Uh, uh, who are you? Like who? You know what roles do you play? Like it's 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 actually like how do you get on a, a bus? Right? Like riding a bus requires a functioning ego. Like you need to know that there's the fuck a bus is. It's a thing that transports people. You know, uh, pay money. Like these are all very egoic things. And so we need to have that to function in society as, as far as like, you know, thousands of years ago, or hundreds of years ago, like this wasn't as needed. Like you could just literally stay in one place in this mountain, not talk to anybody, not ride any buses, not like deal with your family or relation, like, you know, intimate, rela- like, and, and there, you don't need an ego. Like, that's why you see some of these old sages and enlightened people like on YouTube or whatever, like these Indian sages on these like, you know, thrones being carried, but they're just like staring off into space. Yeah. Perhaps they're enlightened, right? Like they probably are, but they don't have a fucking ego because they don't need one. They could live without an ego as human beings in, in the Western world. And then 21st century, we need an ego. You know, like an ego is requi- required and that's, um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because this enlightenment thing, this awakened thing, at least as it as it is now, this being your true self thing, that is going to be, you can call it spirit, you can, I don't know what to call it, energy, right? Pure energy, authentic, like this energy filtering through that ego. Like one of the theories that I learned actually in my grad school, this, I mean, this wasn't all in my counseling program, like, like I took other classes in other departments, sure. but there's like this process of spiritual development and it's, it's called um, uh, basically they look at the ego and they look at how, and they look at kind of soul or spirit or something. I forgot what they call it. And they, they track this relationship of the ego uh, throughout de- development and spiritual development um, and human development. And then the end result is that the ego is actually in service of this transcendent thing. Right. So it's like the ego actually becomes a function, a tool, something for this, you know, and and it's and to clear up that ego, to clear up that ego so that it's a clear channel for spirit or whatever. This is great. I don't don't talk about this stuff a lot, but that is going to require you doing healing work. If you have blockages in your ego if you have blockages in yourself or trauma or places where you don't fully trust or, you know, aren't like whatever it is, you have to clear that out and you can't just clear it out. Like, Oh, okay. I'm going to move this. And now I'm like open. Like you have to do the work of doing the embodiment process. Like we're talking about, like you literally have to change. Ego is also the body. Like you have to change these aspects of who you are, your identity, your body, your nerve such that it is now able to express these energies, the spiritual energy. And we didn't talk about sexual energy, but life force energy, right? Like this is all now going to express through your ego, what we call an ego. Um, So I think it's just maybe a definition problem. It's like 
we're, we're, we we think the ego is bad because it's like takes us away from it's like separation and all that. But the fact is that we are both one with everything. And we're also not, man. Like you're literally right. talking to me from wherever you are in, in Plano, right? <laughs> and yeah, like, yeah. And, and I'm, ta- you know, and so like we're separate beings as well. And uh, the fact that a lot of the spiritual communities don't like understand that or talk about it in that way, um, I think that's the problem. I think it really creates a lot of more suffering, more disconnection and more like ego. It it kind of taps into this ego thing like like I'm bad and this is the way I'm going to be good. So I need to latch on to this when it's like, yeah, your humanness actually is is how can you embrace your humanness? You know, how can you embrace that and make it a part of this mission, this, this purpose that you you're here for, you know, um, whether it's through relationships or, or, or whatever your career. So, yeah, I, 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 I used to think that way as well. Um, until I learned to that, like life is, life is beautiful. Life is spiritual. Like everything has that in it if it's if everything is one that means like literally everything like literally your fucking ego has it too right like it has to right so like there's some something weird going on with the whole spiritual stuff i think it's just a different time to be honest like we're trying to translate old traditions into a very new time that it just it won't translate so we need a new definition it's a fair point man yeah um the way i guess Actually, a complaint, I guess I have um, just from my personal experience. I feel like the, the overemphasis of like, no, you got to get rid of your ego and we're all one. And it actually for someone like me, who's like more neurotic and codependent, I think it actually exacerbates that. It's like this: <laughs> you got You got to be like one with everything. Yeah. And it's yeah, like, yeah. Um, like, then like, damn, I don't even have an ego right now. Like, I, right. You know, so. Right. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So going back to, you know, the Asian thing and the self, like, I think, I think you need a self first before you can um, do all that. And uh, maybe they're not mutually exclusive, but like what I've found with a lot of the, like the gurus in the West that, and a lot of people actually in spirituality in general, they come from the world of the ego already. They come from a world of already having sort of developed the self and, you know, they're working, you know, regular jobs and just uh and then now they find spirituality so their ego is sort of like intact i would say right and and they're now transmuting it transforming it but for people like you maybe or definitely me where like the self isn't the ego isn't even all that able to function optimally in a in a society like the west uh, with emotions and relationships and like you know boundaries like that's important to also work on and develop as well. Um, right. And it's also empowering. Like, like if you just worked on that, like the spiritual stuff probably um, will take care of itself, to be honest. <laughs> I, I kind of think that's true. I, I don't know. Like, I guess yeah. I kind of did both, but yeah. I'm rambling. Yeah. I, and I'm, 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 does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I, so yeah. something came to mind, right? So, um, I'll, I'll just share this, man. So without going into details, I've had one plant medicine experience. Okay. When I did it, I, okay. They didn't tell us what it was. So I have no idea oh, what to expect. Right. Whoa. So, so I took it and I'm thinking I'm going to have this oneness experience, right? I'm going to be at the feet of Christ and, and I'm just going to love and be one with the universe. Did not happen at all. Mm-hmm. Not at all. It was the exact opposite. Sure. And when I was on that, I was like, holy shit, I feel more like an individual than I've ever been. I feel normal. Like, Whoa. is this what it feels like to be normal and not like hate myself? Mm. Whoa. I feel it was like it was the opposite effect. I was like, mm. I am a, I am the most individual person that I've ever been. So <laughs> it's just what, what you said kind of remind me of that. And um, that's cool. So so I've been learning hypnosis and everything. Right. Right. Um, oh, dude, is that a dog? It's a cat. Cat. Nice. Yeah. I um I went to this hypnosis workshop where um actually the the topic was like psychedelics and using hypnosis to kind of guide a um psychedelic experience, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And so the guy that was practicing on me, you know, 
had me remember this time and get insights from it. And I felt like in, in that moment, my unconscious was saying like, dude, this is everything. Mm. That insight of being an individual and being self-accepting, like that's everything. Mm -hmm. So I just like what you said kind of remind me of that. Was that the beginning of all the shadow stuff happening? No, okay. I mean, this was, that was like this year. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's been, it's been a few years. That's a cool it's experience. It's cool that you were yeah. able to like, that, that it was so clearly that experience. And that's one of the things that I really, um, that I don't talk about with a lot of Asian people, but it was one of the first things that I talked about when I first started working with, uh, Asian folks. Cause I was like, this is the most important thing. Like by far through my journey, from what I have constantly observed from Asian people in general, like they just need to learn how to be an individual self and have be, be okay with that. You know, um, it's, it's, it's not okay. And, and that's, and that's, it's deep. It's like a culturally, you know, generations and generations and generations of that. So like the self mm. emerging is going to be very intense, but it's also going to be the path towards feeling more fulfillment. So yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think it's, I think it's uh, cool that you were able to have such a clear, like direct experience of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, and, and, you know, since you're probably more in Western circles, like they're, they're not going to really understand it as much, I think, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think given the context of, yeah, growing up in an Asian family, it makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think you can trust that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was a profound experience. It was, I wouldn't say um, there were no like lasting effects from this particular plant medicine, but it showed me what was possible. Mm -hmm. So, and it kind of yeah. opened up that door, I suppose. Sure. For me. So, mm -hmm. um, you you mentioned uh, uh, sexual energy. Yeah. Could you maybe expound on that? And then, like, you know, what is that? Why is that important? How sure. do we uh, cultivate that? Um, okay. How much longer do you want to go, by the way? Yeah, maybe another um, like another 10 minutes? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, what was the question? Just like, what is sexual energy or like what? Yeah. What, is, it? what okay. is it? You know, why why talk about it? Why is it important for us? So to say it's to say say it succinctly. I would just say that picture in the back of your, you know, the painting, sexual energy is the thing that comes up underneath from the first chakra up through the channels. So that's what I would call sexual energy. So without sexual energy, without opening up to your sex, I mean, we all have life energy because we're fucking alive, but a lot of us don't have very much of life. <laughs> like we're, we're suppressing it. We're, we're, we, you, we might have more like death energy, like, you know, this, this that, that, passion to live and be yourself or to express yourself or to you know be happy successful fulfilled like that is i would say a lot of that is life energy and um so in some ways that's sexual energy but when you really learn how to see sexual energy as that energy as i'm talking about like literally coming up th from the earth through your fucking channel because we are you know human beings we're animals like this is going to drive so much uh um, yeah, I guess that's just one way to illustrate it is, so there's that energy and then there's another energy that's coming down, which is spiritual energy. Um, those are the two primary energies. So, you know, sexual energy or earth, Jesus. life energy, life energy, life energy, and then spiritual energy. And both of those energies are important for human beings to, to, you know, be their full selves. Like, that's enlightenment to me is, is the spiritual energy coming down this life energy coming up and those integrating into the heart. Those are also going to clear out your channels and help you embody, you know, different parts of your identity, um, your true identity, but the two coming together into the heart, that's, I think the goal for humans, that's spiritual okay. energy and sexual energy. It's so like earth energy or animal, like kind of primal instinctual energy, and then like spiritual energy interesting and now that you're saying that and and i'm i'm thinking masculine and feminine i don't know if that yeah, actually yeah, applies in this case oh yeah 100 percent. spiritual like energy, masculine yeah. yeah the earth uh the the sexual energy you know it's it's feminine it's uh 
it's shakti you know in in hindu tradition the kundalini stuff that's that's all they say is 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 feminine energy um and i think that's i think that's true you know corresponds with like earth being mother earth and feminine more nurturing healing interesting okay i would have yeah. gone the opposite thinking. why okay because sexuality is so uh correlated with masculinity yeah, I guess so. I guess more like primal. I think of primal and masculine. Yeah, I mean, it can express, it expresses in different ways when it comes into our bodies, but the pure energy itself is, is sexual energy is p potential. It's like, it doesn't exist yet as um, like this formulated energy. It's just exists as potential. It's like uh, there's it, it, there's nothing there. That's why it's feminine. It's dark. It's like when you just imagine going deep into the earth's crust or like deep. It's just like fucking dark and dense. But there's like, you know, that that that's kind of fem the feminine sexual uh, source of sexual energy, source of all of life. Um, so dark. Um, but then, you know, when you awaken that and allow that to awaken, then you need some structure. That's the masculine. And then that energy comes gotcha. through and and all that but yes and 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 when that energy also that's life energy that comes into our bodies and you know it expresses differently for 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 males or females um and then spiritual energy is masculine because it's very uh everything's differentiated like whereas sexual energy or life force energy or earth energy is unformulated and dark and there's nothing there it's just potential it's just the source of energy. Spiritual energy is like very differentiated. Like it's knowing, right? It's like gnosis. Like gnosis. Everything is clear. There's a lot of light. It's just like, you know, you see things. You see the difference between things. There's like an experience of everythingness, which is everything. Like everything is there. That's oneness, right? But there's also this oneness of the feminine energy, this dark deep, which is like the nothingness. That's also oneness as well. Um, but anyways, these are energies that when we learn how to bring them into our bodies and especially our hearts, that's really what's going to create, um, it's like our animal nature, our spiritual nature coming together. That's like the full human being, you know, mm. it's, uh, that's the potential that we all have. And I don't subscribe to this, um, notion that sexual energy is bad or, or sex is bad bad again like this ego dissolution thing like i i think it's it's a very pure experience and i think it can be a very spiritual experience as well um but it's more importantly it's 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 essential for us to open up to this energy this life force energy this sexual energy it vitalizes us it allows us to be it gives us the energy to to it powers everything it powers our expression it powers authenticity um it helps us heal it's like our body is vital our body is healthy you know that's all sexual energy and uh, if you don't have that you're just like you know you, if you go to these monasteries i've been to a lot of um uh you know places where people go to med meditate i forgot uh, ashrams and shit and you know they're just like ghosts you know they're just like <laughs> walking around like slow and like old and they're just pale like they just have no life energy because they're trying to ascend they're trying to get away from life and it's probably because they feel ashamed of their own sexuality you know but uh you know when you're when you really learn to harness that energy it's like yeah the primal energy is there like you're just a vital person and that goes a long way for for us you know that's a i think that's a good spiritual practice as well to be honest huh so how do we um how do we do that is that through breathing um no breath is um Breath, breath. Yeah, you could do it. I think breath is important. Um, I think it's different for everybody. What I've noticed, oh gosh, I don't know. I've tried teaching this. I've tried to teach this of late uh, to people, uh, especially Asian men, but it, it's hard. I think um, the, the, the work that I did was really unique and special. And I think it's what allowed me to, to embody it in a, in a really whole way. Um, it's kind of like Tantra, but it's not, I, I, again, sort of like this, the spiritual, uh, stuff around ego dissolution, like a lot of Tantra is 
it, it's it's a western version of pure a pure teaching and it kind of dilutes it and it kind of makes it like let's just bliss out and let's just like feel pleasure and it's like that's such a small part of what happens when you awaken sexual energy um so i guess um you can do it through one you got to clear any trauma i think the biggest thing for me was uh, you know one of the things that i was thinking about before this podcast is there's so many things that you can't manufacture when it comes to authenticity like you can't fake like i can't make somebody do this work you know or maybe they just want to feel better but here i am like i can make you into the person that you know like the most authentic fulfilled person in the world but like if you don't want that then you know if that's not a value for you it's not there so the reason why i say that is because i found this work and it opened me up in a way that i just knew again if I want to be myself, right, going back to the beginning, it's like, I'm just, I just want to be myself. What does that mean? Oh, there's something here about sexual energy that I need to embody. And then through this work of like putting my hands on other people's genitals and like meditating in a very safe, non sex, it wasn't sexual in this, I'm going to turn them on, yeah. or this is for pleasure, or this is like, you know, a perform like it wasn't about the other person, it was actually about our own experience. So, this human being and even me we're allowing each other to experience basically energy so sexual energy whether it's in me or it's in another human being like i'm when i'm touching their genitals i'm i'm actually feeling myself experiencing my own sexual life i'm, I'm experiencing life energy life force energy sexual energy mm -hmm. and i'm also noticing the blocks that come up in me because of that Right. So, yes, there's when you can get over that, which I got over really quickly, the fact that I'm touching another person's genitals. Right. And this is just somebody's body and this is just sexual life energy. And the fact that it was held in that way by these facilitators is what I think is really special because I haven't really experienced it like that before um, anywhere else. So they it's just about being human. It's just very matter of fact. It's very much about aware like your own awareness and developing your awareness and where you might have certain things come up around your experience of sexual energy or there was also spiritual energy but it's through this relationship it's embodied it's through this human interaction and it was also very fun and like you know so intimate and healing for everybody it was just a really amazing kind of workshop experience and i did that for a few years um uh, but you know, I don't know, even like some people might have done that workshop and not have had the same experience as me. They didn't, you know, but for me, mm -hmm. it awoke some really powerful stuff. It, it, it was like, you know, pure energy. Like some people were just like, you know, they had their own theories. Maybe they had done Tantra before, but for me kind of coming in without any preconception, it was like, holy shit. Like, sexual energy is life force energy it's in all of us it's this like deep source of potential and it was like whoa and like through these meditations it was just like blasting through my my system and that was actually the first insight to realize like that was kind of the experience and then it took years to integrate um then i think i i don't know if i've mentioned to you but i was having like orgasms without this few years later without any physical contact like I wasn't touching myself. Nobody was touching me. I'm literally driving or like I was in a parking lot and just like oh, intense orgasms just <sighs> running through my body. Well, I'm glad you were in your car now, now outside, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, it wow. was, it was, it was, that was the embodiment process for me. Right. So if we're talking wow. about that process, it was like, I was literally embodying sexual energy. And so, you know, it was uh it was a process i don't really know how to talk about it like it's almost something that i just experienced myself and you know i i i think it's the the good thing is everybody has it like everybody has access to this um but it does require quite a bit of courage because it's a spiritual journey as well like to really tap into that deep feminine you know uh sexual like energy that potential or that sort 
that that that's in, that's insane. Like, it, it's there's nothing there, right? So to like be comfortable and sit in in that space is that's ego dissolution. Like that is literally mm. how you go through ego death. Um, and not a lot of people are going to, you know, we're too in our heads to, to really be comfortable in a space where we're not knowing, you know, where there's nothing literally. And, uh, and so that might be an inhibiting factor for a lot of people, I think, and for spirituality to your spiritual energy, but, uh, but it's a deep, it's a deep process. And I, I'm saying that because I went through that deep process to awaken these energies, you know? Wow. Yeah. Well, on that note, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> how can uh, how can people contact you and uh, if they want to work with you? Um. So uh, yeah, I have the Facebook group, uh, Embodied Asian Men, and uh, yeah, I am working only with Asian men at the moment. But there, there's, I'm 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 always thinking about opening it, you know, like op uh, and not limit limiting it just to Asian people. I work with people one on one on a case by case basis. I don't I don't um, open that up to everybody, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm running a mastermind right right now for Asian men. Um, we don't go into depth as, as we don't go as deep as you know we did in this conversation, but you know this is the frame I hold right. And if you're if people are listening, then they probably can feel something. I hope you know because. Yeah this is embodied for me and these are my experiences. So I hope, you know, there's some sort of transmission because I think people will feel it even if they don't understand it, you know, they'll feel it right. in their body. They'll, they'll feel some reaction and then they get drawn to work with me. But I'm like, you know, this, this, this is a lot of work that I did, but I am holding, this is, this is informing my work and this is the space I hold. And I think this is why, um, you know, it, it allows for people to, to heal. So I, I, yeah, I would just say there's the Facebook group. Um, you can follow me on IG as well. Um, uh, Awakened Masculine. I forgot my social. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in such a like a uh, constant evolution with my business of, of how do I bring this, these types of conversations and this type of work into programs, right? Into content into it's 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 hard this isn't stuff that uh people are going to understand you know they're not gonna mm. they're not gonna immediately if i because i've written about stuff like this you know i write i i've tried to make content about these things um but it's it's not something that is really that you get through through social media or you can get through the like just through a computer screen um, but it's also just not where we we're at as a society, as a, as a culture, as a, as a species, really like we're, there's still a lot of evolution that needs to happen. I'm not saying I'm like the most evolved person, but like, you know, these types of things of focusing on who we are as human beings and these, these essential aspects, whether it's sexual, spiritual, or the stuff around therapy, like that's so we're not, that's not our, where we are, we're, that's not where we're oriented, you know? So but anyways, I'm just saying, yeah, a lot of a lot of things are always changing. So you can follow me and uh, you know join the group. Um, just reach out to me if 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 you have questions or are interested in potentially working with me, and we could have a conversation. Um, but yeah, this is this was good. This was a good conversation. Appreciated it. I appreciate you coming on, man. This was yeah. a fun conversation. Yeah, so, yeah, we covered a lot. Oh yeah. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate you guys tuning in and I will have those links uh, in the description. So I'll see you guys. Peace out. All right. Bye. Thanks everyone.